I wanted to introduce you to the Tea Roses Lazy and Lace Lazy Susan. Um, this is a new pattern that we have, and it's also on a new surface. This is a Lazy Susan panel that you can take off. This is a key to keep it locked into place and not sliding off. And pardon that my back is not base coated, but I haven't um, painted anything on it yet. But you can flip it over, and you now have another surface that you can paint the back on. Okay, so it's reversible. You can do multiple seasons. This goes with the earlier Lazy Susan panels that were scalloped. Okay, so I've got Christmas. You can flip it over. Now you've got some blue Delft. Okay, you can flip it over. And just keep painting panels until the cows come home. The panels are super affordable. Now, one of the things that we've done is we've had to resize the base. This is the new base. And the Lazy Susan panel, we didn't want it to get too big, so it's maybe a half an inch wider at its highest point, and that may not even be true. Yeah, about a half an inch. Okay, these points are super duper duper, like there's, it's not going anywhere. So these are super strong, it's made out of the same material, so you can still put things all the way out to its edge, even though that's cut lace, kind of. So, um, but what we had to do because of the size of this inner panel, is we had to come up with a slightly smaller base panel. And the old base panel, this is my travel one, so ignore that it's all ratty and banged up. The old base one was this size. So we've gone in about an inch all the way around. The nice thing is, if you want to take advantage of doing these scallop um, panels, we've got um, spider webs coming next, and they're brilliant, it's so beautiful. It's very exciting, this laser technology makes me just really super happy. Okay, so if you want to take advantage of doing smaller Lazy Susan panels, then or the smaller inner diameter, so these, you can just simply order one of these panels, and let me show you how that works. The nugget twists off. So say you did a blue delft, and you wanted this nugget to be white because it shows, then all you do is unscrew the nugget, and you buy a new one. I think they're a buck, something like that. Okay, then you can go here, flip it over, and the Lazy Susan part has locating holes. So you just go here until you find the screw, you unscrew it, and this will remove this panel. Okay, then you just take the screw out, you put it in your new one, put the new one on. Okay, so it's super easy to um, retrofit your old base. And what's nice, we tested it for stability. It is exactly the same stability. It's exactly the same Lazy Susan bearing. So you d you're, not, you're not sacrificing any stability. I want to tell you about our roses today. These roses are kind of a combination of a, sh a stroke rose and a shade rose. So what I've done is I've taken, let me see if I have one that I didn't put strokes on. Anyway, I don't think, yeah, this one right here. Okay, so see that this one right here is a little bit plain, okay? And so what's happened is I've just made these little strokes coming out around. So it's super easy to just get your rose in its right shape and format. And then I've done some shading, and then I've added just a couple of little strokes on top. But what I've done that's kind of interesting is I shaded white slightly in from the pink base, and that gave it a frillier look without having to be really good at twisting and manipulating your brush. Okay, um, the whole project is a lot of fun. Um, you're going to learn about strokes just a little bit, but if you're not confident in your stroke work, you could just as easily just do um, descending dots where the strokes are. That would not be a problem at all. This piece is actually um, started out to be a snowflake design, so you could winterize this. This would be fantastic with gold out here. Um, it's elegant. Um, factor just goes on and on and on. Now one thing that I did as well is I painted a little pop top using the same palette and the same roses to show you how you can practice your roses on something simple like this and then make a really cheap, oops, affordable gift um, for a friend, a painting buddy or something. We've got a finial that we've painted that could just as easily be applied to a candlestick and I show you some really cool tricks for using your craft lathe to um, to create um, really straight lines and stuff. So this is our project. I hope you enjoy it. I have, I'm just so excited to introduce this new piece. Enjoy. All right, to get started on our Lazy Susan top, um, what we want to do, we've got a whole lot of details over here. 
There's a couple of ways that you can handle this. Number one, you cannot paint the grooves right there. You can use a jumbo dauber and just very, very gently pat on your paint straight up and down and that'll keep the paint from going into the grooves. Um, I'm more of a fan of going ahead and completing this all the way because there's going to be a lot of work. So because I want to do that, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my extra nonstick mat, which I've just got stored in my paper towel holder. Put this on top of here. That way it's going to take a little bit for drying time because, um, because we're going to kind of glom on the paint. All right, so here's what we'll do. We'll take our paint, shake that puppy up. This is um, Deep Midnight Blue, and it's not a color that I've used very often recently, so I'm going to make sure I'm real shook up. That looks really good. We want to use some multi-purpose sealer. And we're going to use this Italian sash brush. The reason we're going to use this, there's some br bristle brushes that are like half the length of that, but notice that this gets really floppy out here. Okay, and what that means is it's going to, it just kind of collapses and mushes its way into all those crevices. That's what I want. So the very first pass that I take, I'm going to focus on my crevices. All right, so I'm just going to mix the two, the, um, the multi-purpose sealer and the blue. Okay, and I'm going to go every old which way into all these crevices and cracks. It doesn't take very long but it is definitely messy. Okay, so the idea is, is that we want to kind of basically get a base coat. And we can smooth it on the top if we get too junky. And then hair there. Okay, and so we're going to just do this. When we get done, I'm going to rest this mess, look, this is just like a beautiful relief here. I'm going to rest this onto um, like a paint bottle or a glass or something like that and let it completely dry. And then we'll come back and we'll do another coat and I'll show you where we go from there. All right, once I've got it all base coated, um, I'm going to take my very dry um, yellow varnish sponge and I'm just going to go through and pat down all of the ridgy type stuff. It's just going to make everybody flat so when I put the next base coat on I'm not going to have a bunch of ridges to contend with. Okay, I'm going to dry off my brush on my imaginary paper towel. <clears throat> dry all that juicy stuff out of there. I'm going to go and make sure that I've got all of my edges done. Okay, and if I need to come back in and blot a little bit more, I can, or I can save that until after I do this step. And then I'm just going to kind of inspect to look for anything. The nice thing about doing this technique is you don't have to be really base coated blue. You just need to have it really speckled kind of blue. You know what I'm saying? So like as long as there's blue and brown mixed together right there, because it's in shadow, you're not going to notice that it's not completely blue. If you are somebody who would notice, um, then just take a little bit of extra time and just do a second coat and make sure you have really good lights. Take it outside, go look at it outside if you're going to worry about that. Okay, and we'll flatten it one more time and then I'll go put it aside. I'm going to flatten it on the back side as well so that um, I don't end up with a bunch of ridges from my over spray, if you will. Um, by the time this is dried, this will probably be dry too, and I'll show you how I clean these black mats up. It occurs to me that I'll want to get a coat of my base on here as well. So I'll go ahead and just wipe on one coat mixed with my sealer. Make it nice and even. I'm going to put this in a plastic baggie while I'm waiting for it to dry, and then I'll show you the next steps. Okay, I have 
One, I noticed that um, I was, we had a, a leak in my painting room and we had to do a whole bunch of moving things around. When I was setting my paint box back up, I noticed that the, I have four things that are by my painting, like out by my hand, the remote control for the, the camera, my glasses, my, my pop top, Q-tips. Okay, these are um, cute little cotton swabs that take off emergency um, spatters and weird things like that. Okay, and those are the things that I just keep handy all the time. That is what goes there, if you know what I mean. And I thought I would share, we're going to be painting roses. And so my Blue Delft um, pop top, which it started out like this, and just plastic, um, is getting a little bit spattered and yuck, kind of yucky. So I thought, well, I'll paint a new one because the best way to paint something that you're afraid of, like a rose, is to go ahead and paint it on a little sample something. That way you're not committing to a big surface and you have a cute little keepsake in the meantime. So I've got rubbing alcohol and the very first thing I want to do is see if I can't get below some of these spatters. They're sitting on top of varnish and so my hope is without wrecking this piece that I'll be able to take off the top le level and it, yep, it's working. You want to be really careful with this technique because you can eat through too many layers. That's why you do m numerous coats of varnish, so that you can go back and correct things like this. Now my spatters are sitting in there real nice and strong, but I don't mind the spatters so much as the big smear of paint. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this dry, and then I'm going to re-varnish this a couple of times, and then it'll be protected for the next couple of splashes. Okay. So that's a good recovery right there. And see, I've got just that little bit of paint muck on my, on my towel. So I'm going to wipe down, and remove the paint I've gotten splashed on this, wipe this piece of plastic down with my alcohol. Oops, blah, sorry. Getting all the nooks and crannies. I think that's a label of some sort. The nooks and crannies are the ones you really have to worry about. Okay, so then we're going to use paint adhesion medium. As soon as that's dry, I'm going to give it a coat of paint adhesion medium. Okay, and we're just nice even coat, and make sure when you're coming down here around the bottom that you get into all of those crevices because that is where you will have things chipping. Paint adhesion medium is actually okay to use with soap, plastics, metal. It is what you use when you don't want your paint to chip off. So it is, um, you need a bottle of it hanging around because you know that time when you want to paint that thing that you're not sure of, that's when you break out the bottle of paint adhesion medium. Great for people who like to garage sale. Okay, get a nice even coat, allow it to dry completely. That will take a little bit longer than your regular sealers and varnishes. Okay, where I have a little bit of texture right here, I'm going to go ahead and sand really lightly just to knock that back. I want my textures to be the same. I don't want any difference. I'm not going to worry about out here though. Now this is where you can inspect to see how you look inside there. It's looking pretty darn good. Now to get a second coat out here, I'm going to have to give this a second coat anyway. I have bagged my brush. Now I can go into straight paint. I don't need to use the, um, the sealer anymore. Okay, so we're just going to go ahead and give it a second coat. Do the sponge thing again. Allow it to dry. And we should be able to get by with two coats. If yours needs another coat um, after this, just give it a third coat and allow it to dry. Always. You know, it always is determined by how things look on your end, not what I've done on my end. Okay, and I can smooth those out. You want to be careful when you're brushing across these that you don't get pooled gunk. Okay, so probably better to do that with the sponge. All right, I want to make the inside of my piece a little bit lighter than the outside area, so I'm going to use green stretchy tape. And this is tape that actually stretches as you pull it. I'm going to put my tape down right on these cut flat lines and I'll just squinch it in like that 
And then what you do is you pull every so many inches here. You just keep easing it. Okay. And then you press it down nice and firmly. And then you just whoops work that all the way around. Just pulling. And it actually does stretch. You can feel it stretching. Anchor or tap down as you get going around just in small micro um, areas. That way you don't end up with like, rrr, 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 you know, that's the technical term for that effect. Okay. And you can go pretty tight with this. The skinnier your tape, um, the skinnier your tape, the tighter you can go in a circle. And I highly recommend um, collecting all the sizes. I actually have a tape drawer um, sitting here. So I have the eighth inch, the half inch, the quarter inch scotch tape. And I've got blue tape, but it's across the room where I was painting. Um, and I, I have a whole drawer full of tape because you never know when you're going to need one of the different sizes. And it's an invaluable tool. I even got um, drywall tape for making um, interesting effects, which we may try this on this project. I don't know if I can get it even enough. I don't have any tool. Tool um, would work really well to get a faux effect. Okay, so I'll just continue on like this until I get the whole thing taped, and then I'll have a good starting point um, for doing the lighter treatment here. I'm going to wet my surface with my blue a little bit more. I'm probably going to make a mess on the far side of my tape here once I get done with this. So I'm just going to be careful doing this. Get it all moistened with the blue. I want something for this um, sponged color to blend into. Okay. I guess I don't have to be too careful with this color because that's what is on the far side of the... Okay, now I'm going to go into blue that has just a little bit of white mixed into it. So like a dot of white plus like 1 to 8. Okay, and I'm going to just sponge. And I'm going to sponge in a twisty format to make... It. And this has got a little glare for you. Let's see if I can get you unglared. Twisting, 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 twisting. If I get some out here, I'm not going to worry about it. I can just patch it with the other blue. Moving around so that I get even coverage before I dry up. Let's see. I'm going to have to stand up to see what I've got going on. It's almost about right. And I do want it to fade out to this outer edge, so I'm going to go with the clean side of my sponge. And I'm going to blend that some more. And I'm just twisting and kind of, I'm not even really lifting off the surface. And I'm spiral in to the center. It just gives it a dreamy kind of an effect. Go back and get any of them that didn't really get blended. Okay, I think I'm going to add just a little bit more white and I'm going to make the center be a little bit brighter. And I'll dirty brush blend this. And fade it out. And then I'll go in and do the twist and shout there.
I think the backgrounds are like half the fun. Love, love, love doing backgrounds. Okay, so I'm going to do one more pass with the white. It's getting ever so much lighter. I'm about at a value 5 right now. So I started at whatever, like a value 8 that this was. Okay, I'll get this dry and then I'll go through before I um, take the tape off. I'll go through and look for any repairs that need to be made when repair them with my sponge. Okay, so can you see the effect? Okay. So it's just lighter fading out. All right, I think I'm dry. I'm going to take my Ghost Writer, which is a marker that will erase with water spit varnish erasers. It's um, got three um, different switchable things. It's got gray lead, a roller ball that doesn't have ink so that you can trace with a big fat handle so that it's comfortable, which I love, and a white um, ceramic lead. And what I'm going to do is go right next to my tape line, since it's perfectly evenly marked. I'm just going to give myself a line. I think I'm going to want a double line of dots here. And so I'm going to want a marker just to give me a good indicator of where my, my dots should go. Now I'll go ahead and peel off the tape. And... There we go. Perfect. Okay, now we got to decide what to do next. <laughs> That's always the tricky part. All right, I want to create a little bit of drama on the edge, so I'm going to use Payne's Gray and my large um, crescent um, crescent brush. And then I'm going to, and I've got quite a bit of these stinking things are wide. Okay, I've got quite a bit of paint in my brush. I'm not drying it off completely. And I'm just going to rub from the tip in but not all the way in. And I want it to fade. So you don't want so much paint that you're base coating, but you do want enough so that you can tell that you did something. Okay, so see how that is just a little bit darker on the very edge. All right, I'm gonna talk about making strokes. This is an easy stroke brush. This is a pro round. Whoops, get you on camera. Okay, this is a pro round. Both of these brushes make really awesome comma strokes. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about like the criteria of how you make a comma stroke. We're going to get some thin paint. Making comma strokes is more a matter of having the right brush and a good technique, not so much as being like an 800 year veteran and making them. We're going to use fresh paint. Okay. We're going to use thin watery paint like you would use for lining. Okay. So I've just mixed some paint in there, dry off my ferrule. I load into my liquidy paint, okay, and then I dip into my um, thicker paint. Okay, then what we do, I'm going to talk you through it, and then I think I'm going to have to get out a tool to show you. We're going to set the brush down and rest there for a moment, and then slide and let the brush take care of the work. Okay, going super slow like that is really tough when you're making a comma strip. You want to get a fluid movement. Let's see if I can get a better angle. This is the artist buddy, which is going to help me immensely with this project. Okay, let's see. Okay, I think that might help. I'm at a pretty high angle here. Okay, so my hand is supported here and on my pinky, and sorry for all the paint on my hands. I will find this, I promise. Okay, and so I've dipped into there. Now I'm going to press and then lift. I am not moving the brush. I'm not doing a bunch of this stuff, okay? I know that didn't make any sense just then, but so we're going to do it again the other direction. I'm just setting it down. I'm allowing the brush to pull 
and lift. A brush that is a good brush will do that right there. It will come to a chisel point from a beautiful round. A brush that is a good brush will give you this really nice, lovely um, top to your comma. Now mine, because I'm going slow, I don't know if you see that itty bitty little hump right there. That's actually not appropriate, but when you're done with this project, you will not see any itty bitty humps. You want to practice making straight commas, curved commas, and um, let's see, so that's right curved and left curved commas, okay? You want to practice making them about the same length, and you want to not, not stress over this, okay? It's the right brush. You really need a good brush. If your brush does not, um, I'll tell you a little story. I had a lady come in when I had my shop in Portland. Um, she came in and she offered to pay me $30 to do her comma strokes. And I told her to sit down. I slapped a good brush into her hands, and I said, now you try and she was able to make a comma stroke the very first time out. So it's almost always your brush. If you can't make a comma stroke, it's your brush. Please believe that and try a good brush. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make comma strokes next on my piece. Um, by the way, the difference between these two brushes is this one, the Pro Round, is slightly, um, slightly fatter and this gives the easy stroke gives you a lot more delicate look and if you have a heavy hand you can even switch to a liner that will make a good stroke as well okay I'm going to lay the artist buddy down I'll put this puppy on here okay and I'm actually going to do it off center just a little bit okay now what I'm going to do is make comma strokes on these tips, okay, coming down, coming down, coming down, and then just kind of decorate the edges of it. I'm going to use dove, uh, no, slate gray. Okay, I'll get my brush loaded, a watery paint, and then tipped in the gray. Make sure you use fresh paint, okay, and then we're going to rest and make a stroke. Best and make a stroke. And we're going to do that all the way around the piece. If you are having a problem with your strokes, like that one's a little bit fat, just get you on there. Um, if you're having a problem with strokes being a little bit heavy, then just use the thin watery paint instead. Okay, so that gives me my beginning, and then I'll just continue on going all the way around. Well, I thought my Lazy Susan would be a great idea. However, when you have wet comma strokes running around your piece, um, it is not a good idea to be running um, your hand on. So, I'm going to use my bridge instead. And I'll just make my strokes this way. And that will keep my hand out of the wet ones. Alright, so we're going to go in with our same gray color. We're going to top these with white, so don't feel like you're all done when you get them done. We're going to put a nice, pretty, um, good to um, practice on these edge ones, a nice, pretty, pretty good size comma right there in the middle. Okay, and we'll do that on all the big ones. And then we'll add couple of double commas to each side of the the little side sharp um, side little decorated thing and so the upper one is the big one okay. and add those and we'll see what else we need okay I'm going to use the easy dot tool you want to be careful about having paint dry up on your tip of your Easy Dot tool. You want a napkin in your hand, paper towel in your hand, because you're going to dry off a lot. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the number two for my initial set of dots. Okay, and I'm going to use the gray paint. And I'm going to dot in a row and a row and a row. Okay, so what that means, and I'm going to dot, get you on there. I'm going 
the dot in a row down. Okay. And you know, I think I'm going to skip straight to white. You want to use fresh paint when you're doing this. So I'm just going to go ahead and dot the other side in white. It's just going to be a little bit too big a drag to go over and redot those. I'll catch up with the other side of those um, next. So I'm starting at the top and I'm just dotting in a row <clears throat> and then I'm wiping the tip off and then I'm redotting and then when I start I just give one dot on the paper towel so I don't have a huge dot next to my um, my crowning dot if you will. So then we're just going to do the insides of all those. So the first one we don't um, we don't dot on the palette. You want to be on the surface um, meaning that you want to be not halfway on the little crack there. So make sure you don't have half circles. Okay, and that just makes all the difference in the world. Okay, and... I see how splendid that looks when you just have that descending dots. One thing to really think about is to make sure that you have um, lots of drying time. Do not get your hand anywhere near these until they are completely cured because you will make a giant mess and you will be very sad. Alright, I've got all of my dots done. I'm going to add some more, but first I want to get a couple of decorated um, commas. Now my dots are wet so I'm going to stay away for a moment. I just want to show you what I'm doing next and then I'll wait for mine to dry. Okay, we're going to, and you can't even see, I'm going to just highlight right on the tip of these commas that we've done. Okay, that's just going to brighten them up, give them a little bit of perk, and then we'll let everything dry and we're going to go in and do some bigger dots. Okay, we want to go with our bigger dot set, and we'll go with the number. I love that they have numbers so I can say. This is a number. We're going to go with the number one on the yellow, and we're going to do descending dots. I'm going to get out fresh paint, because I have been at this for probably about 20 minutes. So my paint's drying. Okay, get out my number one. I'm going to do one dot. See how big I like that. I think I'm going to do a number one with one dot on the palette. Okay, and we're just going to give connecting dots to all of these, and then I think we'll do, hmm, herein lies the crux of the thing. Let's see what we're going to do. Alright, we'll go to a number four, and yeah, that's just a little bit smaller, and we'll dot. Well, dot something. I don't know what I'm dotting. Okay, I'll figure it out and I'll come back. All right, I added dots on my white line. We're going to take slate gray and we're going to wash it down. We're going to blot on our paper towel. And I'm going to just do a wash of the slate gray on this band to give it the effect that it's a like a hem or a thing like that. And this is where my Q-tips will come in very handy. Okay. Okay, so just a nice washy um, band. Okay, my my um, paint adhesion medium is finally dried. It takes quite a bit more time for things to dry on plastic than you'd think. Non-porous items are always slower to dry. Okay, so I have my base coat, dark, deep midnight blue, and I've got some paint adhesion medium. And the first coat that I put on, I'll make a mix. It just helps everything um, bond. Now the first coat's not going to do any covering at all, but it is going to bond really well. So that's what I'm going for. And then I'll do two more coats of just the blue 
and um, and I'm going to let this coat dry overnight, and then I will make sure that that will that will determine that I have excellent adhesion. Okay, when we're painting something that's plastic like this, it's always ad advantageous pages to do a um, scratch test. So I always go on an inconspicuous area and I do a scratch with my fingernail test. And I know that I didn't tell you what these things were for. These are to pop open your bottles. These little paint globs that dry on your bottles are what makes the bottles hard to open. And when you paint a lot, like I do, you need something that will open that. And what I love about these is, this is a brand new bottle, is when you get it underneath the corner right there, it actually rips that plastic and so it makes it really easy to remove the plastic as well. So no more, it doesn't look like it'll do it, but it does it and I've used them consistently for probably three years. Um, they all work and they're all awesome. So they'll save your hands and your fingers. My, my thumb used to like bleed. So then on your scratch test, you just put a little paint back over it and let that fully cure. I'm looking for shiny spots because I have blue plastic over and under blue paint and we'll be ready to paint him. Okay, another thing that I was thinking about is, you know, I've got these, this is a mint can, and you, they make those um, Altoid cans and everything. Um, you can treat these exactly as if, like this pop top, and this one's got a little raised side right over here, which I wish they would do that. But I hate to throw these away because they're so sturdy and wonderful and great. So I'm going to go ahead and just prep this just like I did the pop top, and this would be a fantastic thing to put a couple of little roses on and a monogram and give as a gift filled with like M&Ms as like a painter's candy kind of thing or whatever but this is this is the kind of th thing to practice roses or lace on. I've got my pieces for my finial. When you put um, a screw and a washer in the bottom of one of these or just you can glue on a washer it'll stick to the magnet and I'll show you that part later. But what I did is I'm stacking up the different pieces. Oops, I think I've got this. There we go. Got this all figured out. It took me a while. I have a whole drawer full of these little bits. And so I'm going to stack up these pieces so that they look like that. Very elegant and nice. And this gives me a good place to sprinkle a few more roses. So now what I'm going to do is while I'm waiting um, for other stuff to dry, I'm going to go ahead and just seal everything and base it all in the deep midnight blue. One of the things people ask frequently is how to change the lead in the Triple Threat Ghost Rider. So what the Triple Threat Ghost Rider is, is it's got a gray lead, a white lead, and, oops, and a roller ball. Sorry about that. And the roller ball is empty, doesn't have any ink, and it just rolls your pattern on. It's very, very nice. It has a comfort grip, and it has an eraser at this end. Okay, so that's what it is. It's the best-selling product on our website besides the Deluxe Craft Blade. So um, it's just something that we just, um, it's irreplaceable. Now what's unique about this is the lead is erasable with um, water, varnish, spit, eraser, that kind of stuff. It, it, anything will take this off so you don't end up with your um, sketches varnished onto your piece. So the way that you do this, you hold the middle, okay? And one of the tricks I like to tell people is buy the cartridges instead of buying multiple color of the pens um, because then you can just change your lead anytime you want to whatever color you want it to be. Okay, so that comes off and then you pull out whichever one you want to have come out. So I'm going to take the gray out. Okay, then you release the lead. Okay, get that down there. And if you need a little help, then use a little pin. There we go, that released. So now I have my lead out. We just pop that in there, and then we put that right back, and it's kind of a push, okay? It, you'll feel it clunk in. You screw it back together, and then you twist it to the one that it is, and then you just prime it into its position, and then pretty soon your lead shows up. It takes a little bit longer than you think it does, Almost. There we are. Okay, so that is how you change the lead on the Triple Threat Ghost Rider. 
All right, we're going to dip into a little bit of DecoArts Canvas Gel. Okay, we're going to flatten it in our brush. We're going to pick up a little bit of the dark Hauser Green and just mush the two things together in flat. I don't want a big, chunky bunch of stuff. And then somewhere coming out of these different areas, we want to just bring a trail of some green. It's going to be kind of transparent. It's not going to be very bright. If it gets bright, mix a little bit more medium. Okay, and this is just going to give us loose little leaf shapes. Okay, just want to give some weight to our different areas here. Okay, so that when we do put flowers down, um, you know, we don't have them just sitting on nothing. Okay, I'm just, I'm pulling out on the flat edge of the curved flat. And I'm doing a very messy job. And the reason I want that messy is because I don't want there, I don't want people to be like, oh, look, there's that leaf. Because that happens on top. You don't get to see the bottom stuff very well. I'm going to do that on all three sets. And, um, and then I will, then we'll move on. Okay, so while I had some banging around going on, um, we've got some construction happening. I went ahead and finished one bunch um, so that I can show you one bunch. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with the curved flat. Okay, get you on camera. And we're going to get into our canvas gel medium, our dark um, Hauser Dark Green. And the very first thing we want to do is set a plate, if you will. Okay, so we're going to put some green where things are going to come out. We don't care how things are formed. We want tips on them. Um, you can slip slap just a little bit if you wanted to. And the combination of the canvas gel and the Hauser Dark Green being such a dark color is going to be um, just a wonderful, like, it'll blend with the background color. So we want to make a plate for everything to sit on. So if, if these spots just sit on top of the blue, then it's going to look like nothing, there's got, not going to be any depth, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So we want to give a little bit of depth, and we can have, see we've got these, these um, leaf things reaching out. We could add a couple of dark somethings happening out there just to give that a little bit more bulk or we could you know shine them down a little bit okay so we, what we want to do is we want to create a bridge of color going all the way around so these need to be reaching and hugging for each other so make sure that your lines when you're doing this reach and hug okay so I'm going to let this part dry, and I'm going to go ahead and finish this part over here. Notice, please notice, don't count these splotches when you're on the camera, um, if, because there's no right or wrong. You want to just fill in some of your area. I highly recommend this loose sketch of roundness, because your stroke rose just needs to fit within that round sketch. Um, I'll have sketches on here with the different petal lines, but that's not necessarily going to be your rose. The rose is always the personality of the person painting it. Okay, so I'll go ahead and do this step and then I'll come bring you back. Okay, so I've got about the same amount. Okay, so now I'm going to take without so much canvas gel and I'm going to just wipe some leaves on them. I'm just laying my, leaf, my, my curved flat. Let's get you there, sorry. I'm going to just wipe the leaf on. I'm laying my brush sideways. And I'm just going to add some brush, um, some leaves that are stronger dark green. Okay, not on the same spots that I was for the other stuff. I don't want it too busy. Don't get it too full. This is busy, but it's not so busy. And now I'll add that on my other set. Okay, we're going to take Hauser medium green and a little bit of our um, Hauser dark green. And now we're going to start putting on our real leaves. And they're just going to be kind of a loose base coat. I need points, and that's about all I need. Oops. Keep your hands out of the wet stuff. 
I'm gonna scooch these guys down just a little bit so and we want to take the same brush mix and we want to create these um, this is where this brush is awesome because it will do perfect little leafy poos mix it with a little bit of medium and you want just to have some little trailing bits of leaves and I need that whoa 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 I went into Hauser light green instead of Hauser medium green that would be a really Big surprise. Okay, so I just get little trailing greens. Okay, we don't want it to get too fat this way because we want there to be some like lovely white space here. Okay, we'll let that dry. Okay, now we'll go into a little bit of a side load and I'm dirty brush side loading I don't don't get notice that nothing is base coated um, the reason for this is is this okay what's really interesting is this lace is very stiff these roses and um, stuff are very very loose so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create something that doesn't have harsh stop and start lines to um, to be able to flow okay so I want to see choppiness. I want to see rough edges. I want to see transparency. I want to see streaks. So when you're doing this, don't try to make it perfect. It's just one little stroke and get out of there. So now I'm going to go in to my dark with my dirty brush that isn't floated or done bright or anything. And on one side of the leaves that I'm going to detail, I'm going to just put some dark in there. Okay, so just either side. I'm not doing a color source or a light source. Just a little bit of a line of green. Isn't it amazing how much difference um, painting with the Lazy Susan makes? I mean this thing just will transport you from place to place. It makes it so easy. Something like this where you don't want to mess up what you've already done. Um, this is like you don't want to be like banging these around. They're very 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 sturdy but you still don't want to be trashing the edges and stuff. So it makes a big difference to be able to just rotate around. Notice my strokes. I'm going to go ahead and show this again. It's it's ugly. I'm not trying to be like, you know, silly about it, but I'm just pity patting the paint. Okay, and that's just going to get that dark color back there. Okay, and now I'm going to wash my brush. I know, hard to believe. And we're going to go into um, the Hauser light green. Okay, now I'm going to load a, just a little bit of the canvas gel medium. You do want to be careful with canvas gel medium. It reactivates with water, so if you um, decide for whatever reason to get in there with some floaty stuff and it's got water you want to be careful of the canvas gel and you know what let's start with Hauser light green Hauser medium green sorry but gel and it's a float it's a side load all right I'm gonna find my leaves that are pointed towards me I'm gonna pull from the back whoops too clunky Okay, and I'm just going to pull tips out. This is where I do all the disguising work. Look at how pretty that turned out. Let's get you in closer. Okay, so see how nice and crisp the little edges are. Okay, now I'm going to rotate this, hopefully, so that I can get you back on camera. And I'm going to pull out the other way. Okay. There, I've created just a little sharp edge leaf just by pulling a few little... Um, vein things out. And we'll come over here. Same thing. Okay, so see how it did not matter that my leaf was not perfectly base coated because we've got other stuff going on top. Okay, and it doesn't matter if there's certain amounts of these on one side or the other. 
Um, notice this one right here is a disaster, right? It's an absolute disaster. So we're going to go into this. Keep you on camera. The worst thing about this, if I haven't got it on straight, then we end up with an uneven rotation. Okay, so now I'm still disastrous in the middle. So what I'll do is I'll go into my little Hauser green and which was I working on? And I'm just going to pity pat on top of that and just tone it down just a little bit. Okay, and if that doesn't work, then I do it just a little bit more. There we go. And then, you know, I'm going to spatter on these things and everything anyway. So that's what you're going to do to the main leaves is just that same technique. All right, we're going to um, paint our roses and I'm going to walk you through how to, pardon my messy palette, how to make a little blending strip. So we're going to go into the toe is going to be into the um, pink chiffon. The heel is going to be in raspberry. And we're just going to blend. If we want, we can have a little bit of the medium on our brush. It's going to make it transparent, so only use just like a little teeny dressing. It's a good thing to make paint colors slide around, but not so much that you make it transparent. I'm probably going to have to get out the fresh color. And so I'm just blending. Every now and again, I might come backwards on it just to keep it from building up a big ridge. I don't want these too juicy. We'll stay on that same blending spot. Okay. And now we're going to go at the top of our rows, okay, and we're going to just create a little, um, a little tripod kind of thing. And you can blend, I can go back and forth into, um, like right in front of this and have there be a couple of strokes just for a little bit of a messier, messier look. And I'm a little closer. Um, okay, so, and I don't mind the separation. Now, what you want to avoid is having anything be like too long. Okay, so I just keep adding paint to my brush. Keep your brush tipped to the right side as you're blending on your blending strip. Okay, now the next thing we'll do is we'll plop a rose right in, right in the middle, not drawing it too far down. Okay. Just kind of cross over the divisions. I'm refreshing my paints. <clears throat> now we'll close this. I'll put a dot and a dot or a brush length right there. And then I'm just going to stroke across. Okay. What is really interesting is these um, little extra hash lines end up actually looking like another layer of rose. Now I'm going to sideways slide, not too long, changing the angles, depending on how long my other stroke was, and then we'll come across the bottom. So see how I'm just stroking, stroking, stroking? That's okay. And I'll turn this to get a better angle. I got you right off camera. I'm really off center on this thing. Okay, so that is our form, our basic form. And what we're going to do next is we're going to just do that to all of the other roses. And then what? Then the next thing that we'll do is um, put the top petals on right here. Okay, so all the roses are exactly that same technique. You can rewind and watch over and over again. Okay, so we've got a little bit of open space. So what we'll do is we'll just go in and we'll add just a lower rim or bowl, wherever you need one. Kind of cant it um, so that it's wider at the, at the bowl part. And that choppiness just really gives it a ruffly feel. So don't be afraid to chop at your roses. And I'm already seeing a little bit of a theme here. Let's back you up. I think I'm going to have roses of bigger sizes. Like a, These are big. These are small. We'll see what we end up with. I may have to repaint these ones. Um, okay, so we'll get this last 
we've got here. Okay, and we'll fill in the others. All right, before we get too busy, or our roses get too busy, we're going to take a little bit of our um, raspberry color, and we're going to float to deepen our bowl color on one side. See where I blended that. So just kind of blend off to just one side of the bowl. Okay, just to give that a little bit more depth. I'm losing my blending strips here. The next thing we're going to do is very dry float with white. Very, 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 very dry. And what I want to do is I want to give a lower petal. Let me get you in close. So I can keep you on there. I want to do a little inside petal lower than the petals that I've already painted. Okay, see how that one sits there and that one sits there. Okay, you want to do the same thing in the front. I want to leave little slivers of white here and there. Give a little choppy thing going in the back. Okay, that's just going to give us a fluffier rose look. And a little bit frillier. Okay, we'll do the same thing down in front. And we're, we still have to add our front petals. That's coming. Okay, but I like I like the painterliness of this effect. Okay, so I'm going to add just a little bit of extra. And we'll do that to all the roses. Okay, we're going to increase the shading with a little teeny bit of cranberry wine on the toe of our brush. Okay, so we'll get in. Just increase the darkness just a little bit. Add a little drama. Okay, keep it out of the white area because otherwise you'll end up looking very, um, very pink. Okay, just want to deepen into the area that I had deeper shading added. Okay, let me get you back so you can see what it looks like. Okay, those just look a little bit more interesting now. All right, we're going to redo our blending strip with our pink and our raspberry, our pink chiffon raspberry. We're going to come on to our roses and we're going to add just a couple of interesting chops. Okay, just a few, just to make the rose feel fuller. Okay, and we'll do that to all the roses. Okay, and what's really interesting to me is I used a yellow color in these roses and I also used um, antique maroon instead of cranberry wine. And as I've been looking at them, they've been bugging me. As I finished these nice pink ones, the dirtiness of these roses is really bugging me. So this is a really great opportunity to show you what you do when you mess stuff up. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do: is we're going to back it out. So like I just, I think it, I think these are just so much better that I'm willing to go ahead and back this down one. My um, big technique for making correcting errors is to just go back a step. So we're going to pretend like the roses aren't there, and we're going to go and just, I don't care about the texture of the painted rose, we're just bringing it, bringing it back to blue. The rest of the stuff doesn't matter. And just do it loose enough so that you don't get a line. Okay, we'll pretend like that leaf's not there. I might have to patch the leaf, but we've got other stuff to do anyway. Okay, so I'm just going to bring those back down, and then I'm just going to do exactly the same technique that I did over here. One thing I really, truly, truly do advise, when you're painting a rose, what will happen is the more often you do it, the more practiced you'll get, 
And what that means is that you're going to find that your rose gets prettier and prettier and prettier the more you do it. So what I suggest seriously is things like this, things like this. Have some of these things prepped and sitting around. And that way you practice on these. It's going to stand alone. And then you can make your pretty roses all together on your project because you've already practiced a few times. All right, we're going to add some um, lilacs, kind of. We're going to use um, dioxazine purple and the canvas gel medium. And we're going to sprinkle some dark areas here and there with the... I'm going to get a great big giant guy going back here. This is providing a foundation for um, what we're going to do next, which is to, you know, highlight and stuff like that. So we need to have, once again, that um, plate. If we don't have the dark down there, then we don't have a place to put our flowers. Okay, so we'll go... We can't just go from blue to purple, to l lavender color purple. You don't want this to become, become a big purple project, so do be careful not to do too many. And everywhere that you put dark purple, you don't necessarily need to make a bright flower there. Okay, so we can have some things just sticking out here and there. Okay, so wherever we've added the flowers, now we'll pick up some white and mix it with our purple, just a brush mix. And then we're just going to add little clusters of this lighter purple. And on the bigger ones, you can make little cute side cluster things. And it's just really a dibbly dab. Okay, you're just dabbing just a little bit here and there. adding that pretty little purple color, and then a little bit more white, dirty brush, and that's going to be your highlights. Not everywhere this time. I'm using the um, Filbert brush to do this. Okay, so I think that that's probably good. And you look up or look at the um, the piece and you squint to see if you've got a good color balance. I'm missing one right there. Isn't it funny what happens when you squint? I need to go back down one step to my lighter purple. If you put something down and it goes, whoa, then um, you've definitely got it too strong. Okay, now that I did that, I feel like I need something over here poking out. All right. I probably could have a couple of little things coming up there and there. Okay. I think that that's going to be just enough. Okay, switching to a really little brush, I'm going to make really little rose buds. Same exact technique. Just going to do everything miniature. We're going to sprinkle a couple of those around. And they'll just be little versions. This is um, the eight, eighth inch um, workhorse flat. All right, now it's time to strengthen roses and leaves. Okay, we need to bring our colors. What I'm trying to do now is bring bridge colors together. So I don't want to put any other inside details and things like that until I see what kind of bridge I get. Okay, so I'm going to take my curved flat. I'm going to take my... Um, a little bit of a washy kind of base coat of the, not base coat, it's going to be washy. Um, let's put a little bit of medium in there. Of the, what's it, what is this stuff called? It is called, I can find it, canvas gel medium. And we need to bring our leaves walking kind of outwards towards each other. Okay. We need to make sure they arch and that they're definitely leading on a path. Okay. I think 
we're going to need a couple of bigger leaves in here. So we'll go into, I think I have one started right here that I just kind of missed. Okay, break some of this green area, these dark areas. Let me give this guy a, a leaf. under okay and I know there's a couple of little stroppy something or another going on here. Now we'll take, wash the brush, and we'll take our um, olive, no, Hauser Light Green, and we're going to side load. And now this is where we're really going to lead the eye. Okay, so you can see that I've got these brighter leaves leading this way. Okay, so we want to Bring the eye on a little journey. Towards this other um, color here, this other side, this other set of roses. And then every now and again, sprinkle some of that color on a bridging element, like this element is on the way towards that element, and the upper part of this element is as well. So don't leave it isolated just to these outside tips. The same thing here. This is where the painting, I love this part of the painting, because it just, that's where you start bringing all the colors in. You can make believe stuff is going on, create a story. doesn't seem to reach as far. Brush is dry. Okay, this might need a little bit more. Okay, we'll go into just a little bit of marigold. Marigold's that color that I wasn't sure about on those roses, so I want to use this sparingly. And you keep that color within within the, the lighter green color that we just sprinkled around. Here. Just little flicks of color. It's, my brush is real dry and real kind of crusty right now. Okay, now I sit back and I squint to see what else we need to do. Okay, we're going to stipple. So I have a foliage stipple brush. I'm going to pound this on my palette. And when I say pound it on my palette, I am, oops, put you on there. Pounding hard, so I'm spreading the brush open. We're going to get some greeny, white, something or another going on. So that's um, medium foliage green plus a little bit of white plus a little bit of water. And you want it real watery like a baby's breath kind of look. And that should fade down. This gives us just a little bit of fullness. 
We've got some emptiness going on here. I don't know if that's going to be okay or not. We'll see. The great thing is, is you're the painter, you're the artist, so you get to decide how much is... It's getting fuller. Okay, I think a bit more down here. Okay, now we need to balance out where we're at with the um, with some spatters. We're going to use some purple. The purple plus um, a little bit of white. About the same medium colors. About equal amounts of each. Don't make it too light or you'll be very sad. Okay. And that is another carrying bridging color that is going to bring us towards our um, other sets of flowers here. Very watery. Okay, and now I think let's get out some of the Payne's Gray. And we'll spatter with Payne's Gray. And we'll do this fairly heavily, so I'm going to come out over here. This is one you'll be so excited that you have an artist buddy because your hands and everything will stay out of the spatters and it is just a wonderful thing. You won't be running your piece through the spatters that are left on the table. And a little bit more water, a little bit more Payne's Gray. Now we're going to go into the white plus some of the deep, is it deep midnight? Yeah, deep midnight blue. Just slightly lighter, not too light, than what we've already um, got in the center. Now that I'm going to stand up so I can kind of control. I'm going to anchor. Nope, I'm going to float. gives it just a little bit more. Now let's give the greens some bridging power. We're going to do a little bit more with these roses, but um, I just we're going to go into Hauser Light Green with a lot of water. A little bit more than that. Okay, I know you can't see this. It's just a lot of water, and I'm spattering off on my pa on my palette. All right, now this is the tricky thing that I love to do. We're going to anchor. A heavy handled something and where we want them to land if it's anchored the lower down you are the more you can get exactly where you want to be so and then you smartly tap so now I can spatter let me show you a little bit closer on let's go on these guys over here get in close to these guys scooch over okay so I'm anchoring I'm down low, and then I give it a tap, and it lands exactly where I want it to. Okay, and that is just such a neat way. Look at how that little bit of green just surrounds that area right there. I'll do the same thing on my greens. And that just makes it fuller. And just it adds something to it. Okay, now I'm going to wash over the ends of some of the rows with a little bit of really, really washy um, raspberry. I want part of the rose to seem brighter than the other part of the rose. Okay, let's see, and I'm assessing.
And I think that just gives it a little bit better depth. Makes them not seem quite all the same. This one's gonna have to be on this side. I keep it where on the side that you were shading on. For a little bit more uniformity. It's like half your rows will be in shadow. I'm not worried about my brush going off of the page because um, because the um, rose would have petals that were sitting like under it, kind of like those. Those would be the darker shadowed ones. Okay, let's see. And that gives us a little bit more depth. I'm going to get just a little bit of the cranberry and just deepen the outer edges of that. Cranberry is real transparent, but it's also very dark. So be careful with it. <coughs> stand up and get away from it a little bit so I can see what I got. Okay, we want to go ahead and spatter with just a little bit of our pink. Our pink seems to be an isolated color. It's always a good idea to move your iPhone when you're spattering. So you won't be able to see your screen. bit of the bright the pink the pink chiffon and that's just less of a spatter and more within the ribs area going to take Payne's Gray on our little um, round brush on the dark side and we're going to stipple the base. This is going to be the base for the um, stamen things, the calyx, whatever those things are called. All right, as soon as you get that dried, I'm going to add some of these mustard dots with the brush tip. Okay, and they can be kind of chunky. It gives that little bit of yellow inside each of the throats. <clears throat> and you can go into white. And you can add a couple of whites as well. All right, now I'm looking at this through the next day's eyes, if you know what I mean. You get, you sit down, you put it away for the evening, you come back the next day, and okay, what do you think? And the only thing that I really have to, I love it, the only thing I really have to say right now is I think I have a little bit of isolated color. The pinks are still very isolated, even though I'm making a good bridge. Now, the argument was made that when I get the finial done, that I will have pink coming up through here. And that is a very good argument. So in theory, I ought to wait to do anything until I get done with that. But I'm not going to. I'm going to use my um, raspberry color. 
and I'm just going to dry rub a little bit in the background, reaching through my greens. Okay, just reaching out, with just a little scumble. <clears throat> can even be on a couple of my greens if I want it to be. So just enough to say, hey, what's going on there? I think that just brings it together just a little bit more. We can add some pinks throughout. I don't want to, this to become some like pink thing, but okay. And I think I like that a little better. We'll go into the pink chiffon dirty brush and we'll just ever so lightly lighten that. Okay, now it appears that we're bridging just a little bit better. Just a scribble. Just pretend like you don't know what you're doing and that's usually the best way. just to soften. And we can have a little bit of a glow coming off of our roses. Okay. I think that's plenty. Just that little teeny bit just gives me this nice feeling of the colors continuing. Alright, so I've got all my pieces all stacked up and painted. And I want to make sure my edges are smooth. I'll sand and apply one more coat of paint. Sometimes it's these cross-cut edges that are the, the problem children of the sanding world. Just get that nice and... It, the more smooth this is, the more professional it will be. The finishing for your Lazy Susan, because of all those cuts, I would definitely go for a matte, um, a matte varnish and follow it with a wax. And I'll spray mine outside and then I'll show you how to do the wax. Okay, so I'll get all these guys sanded, anything that seems rough. Rebased, and I'll be back. Okay, the first thing <clears throat> that I'd like to do is I'd like to go ahead and start embellishing on my pop top thing. Okay, so I've got just like a sketched thing going on here. I've got my Raphael brush um, pre-wet, so it's got some water in it. And I'm going to make a puddle. You want to pre-soak your Raphaels because they're natural fibers. And just like your hair, um, if your hair gets rained on, it doesn't really absorb the water. But if you stand under a shower, then your hair is sopping wet and it takes forever to dry. That's how natural hairs work. <clears throat> so you want to make sure that you start with a wet brush so that it um, will do what it needs to for the paint or for the brush flow. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just stroke this line with as even pressure as I can and then I'll turn it around and I'll stroke this line coming from the other side and notice I don't try to do the whole thing with one stroke okay that is a no-no now I'm going to do some cross hatching my brush needs to be standing up on my tippy toe which is why you're having a hard time seeing my hand. Notice how fine that line is. That is why we use the Raphael. This brush will last you 30 years and maybe even longer as long as you don't let the moths get to it because it is natural fibers. <clears throat> it has a super duper fat belly. I don't know if you can see it but it's super duper fat and that means it holds lots of liquid. When I do my cross hatching, I never start right on the edge. I always start out just a little bit further. Cross hatching is a really, really elegant technique. Okay, that just, I don't know, it just adds to a lacy moment. We're going to wet down our white. Okay. 
I always dry off your ferrule too. I never feel like I can paint with a wet ferrule. Okay, and we're going to accent some of this border. This is where I'm not such a great teeny tiny painter. But with a brush that will do what I want it to do and stay skinny, then I can manage. Okay, then we'll take our Easy Dot tool and all those extra little fuzzy white lines will go away as soon as I erase them. We'll take the Easy Dot and we'll dial it down to number one. Okay, we're going to go into Fresh Paint and we're going to dot our cross hatches. I can usually get two or three out of one before I have to wipe off. Okay, and I'm going to allow those to dry. We're going to take our flat brush in good condition and we're going to make checks. This is where I hate even being on camera because this is where I have to micro focus and you guys are going to be like, yeah, look at her. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to keep it off the ground, although the ground is what is steadying me, so. Now some steadying techniques. Number one, when you're trying to do something that you need to focus on, breathe out as you're doing the stroke, especially if you're doing some microscopic lining. <clears throat> Don't talk to a video camera <laughs> while you're doing it. Um, focus on the tips of your brush. Don't drink 12 cups of coffee. A lot of people forget to attribute that um, the stuff we're eating or drinking, um, like tea and coffee and stuff like that, Red Bull, can affect you know the steadiness of your hands. Let's split the difference in this last one. Okay, now we need to make those checks be a little bit brighter and perkier because they're just kind of drab and dull. So then just yeah, not so much. Okay, so we'll corner load. And blot to wet. The tinier your floats, the more you want to um, blot. Okay, now I'm going to do a little corner kind of floaty thing. I'm going to turn my brush at an angle and then I'm going to go across. I'm going to do the reverse with the dark. So I just really am wanting that corner shaded. I've got all the way around there. Now I'm going to go into my cranberry wine, I think is what it is. I lost my cranberry wine. My cranberry wine. Okay, and we're going to do the opposite corners. The same exact technique. And that just gives our check just a little bit more depth. So when you're focusing, you should whisper to your project like I'm doing. much nicer. All right, we want to go into our thinned white. Let's just add a little cross hatching going across here. Just three little stripes. I'll just give it some busyness and then we'll go ahead and line the checks. Okay, we're going to thin out our Hauser Medium Green, and we're going to make a little squiggle line. I've already tested to see if I'm going to like it. Just cut it straight up the middle, and just kind of an elongated squiggle all the way around. And then we'll take our little number one that we made all of our stroke work with, also makes awesome little leaves. 
dry it out and then you're just going to pop on little leaves and going down is the hard part so I'm going to cant my brush to an angle and these are not going to be quite as pretty I'm going to have to try harder down there because I'm going to hit this little lip here that I've got but the top ones are super easy to do so we're going to add a number one white dot, dot once at the base, right up the middle of the blue. Wipe off your brush or, yeah, everything's a brush. Anything that applies paint in my book is a brush. Okay, and just do a little graduated dot sequence. I'm going to take just a little bit of the green, the light, the house or light green. And I'm just going to give just a little bit of a highlight, not covering the whole leaf, just a little bit. And you, oops, that was just like a dot. Hello. You could highlight your vine as well, just a little bit, just a running skip stroke. Okay, and a running skip stroke would be just some of the, oops, that's not the lighter color. There we go. Make your little puddle of watery paint. And so you could just choose spots just to give it just a little bit more pop and layer. These finials are the funnest things. You could do lamp stick, lamp, lamp sticks, candlesticks um, to go with these. You could do lamp shades. You could do so many things. You could have so much fun. These would be fantastic in the bathroom this um, pattern that is. Okay, we're going to want three, let's get you to just a little bit closer, we're going to want three clusters of roses here. So we're going to take this microscopic 1 8 brush. Be patient with tiny roses because tiny roses do not have to have the same amount of detail as big giant roses do. Okay, so we just want to kind of cant them slightly to the side, not enough color. Cant it. It's the same exact technique. Now you can do little short strokes like this. So once you feel confident that little tiny quarter inch long strokes that are straight um, can be done, then it's easy to make little rose buds. Okay, and then our inside one, that's just a little half moon shape. Those of you who are watching on um, the website, um, I wanted to, I've had some people say that they can't see as clearly when the videos are really long, like the ones we put up for free, the bandwidth and everything plays in, then they're, they're perfectly clear um, when you're on your big screen off of the DVD. Okay, so now we'll make that little, close the, the mouth of the rose, load a little bit more paint, just keep loading a little bit of paint, and now we'll drag this around. Okay, so we have a little bud. Okay, it's not a perfect little bud, but when we put our leaves around it and different things like that, this little guy looks like he's in a weird spot. Okay, when we put our leaves around it, let's give him a couple of little top petals. And then we'll come over here and we'll do another little rose bud down here, and maybe we can get four or five around there. On our little pop top, I want to make a rose that's more like a practice rose, so I don't want to put a rose there that is going to be something I'm not going to be, uh, that I'm going to struggle with because of the size of the brush. So I'm going to go to a bigger rose, and so I'll use my quarter inch brush, which makes um, real roses, if you will. Okay, that's the brush I used on the bigger piece. But we're going to make little, little roses. So we're just going to rein in our stroke size. Okay. And the whole concept of this is to practice a rose. So we'll come over here, keeping our stroke size small. OK, 
Okay, and we're, I'm on either side. Okay, I'm canting it. Okay, I just keep reloading as I feel like I'm not covering or I'm not getting strength. And I'll alternate back and forth so that um, I give the paint at least one second to dry before I do the next thing. There's our bowl. Now that'll need to be shaded. Do you see how I lost that? Easy to do. I'm not dropping down very far. That's why that's getting lost. Okay. Finishing the shape of the rose. I'm really tucking it in so that I don't end up with a ginormous rose on here. Okay, so my pink kind of grew up, but you know it'll take care of that, those little other strokes. But see how you can take the same brush and you can squash it by just cutting across the top of the rose. And then just maybe switch it to just your toe. Okay, so now I have two roses there. I'll wait for those to dry and we'll embellish them. And I think right now we can probably do some leaves. So I'll take, um, let's see, I think I'll take some Hauser Dark, a little bit of water. And I think I want to make this busier. So I have a few more leaves coming out. Wow. All the brushes go rolling down. Okay. And maybe another one out here. Maybe this guy gets one that's coming into the lace. It's a good idea to cross across your borders. Like if you've got something going on, don't be afraid to get in its face. Okay, now pick up just straight um, Hauser light green. And now we're gonna make off of the, not on the dark ones, just next to some of them, we'll make another leaf. That way we've got like a whole bushel of leaves, but some are secondary and some are primary. Maybe we want an odd number, so I'll put a second one over here. Okay, that's looking kind of cute. So, really, truly, if I sat down and focused, besides the prep, you've got to have your prep done ahead. Um, if I sat down and focused on one of these little pop tops just for practice and fun, you could be done with it in two or three minutes. It just doesn't take any time at all. Okay, we're going to get into our um, cranberry wine, the really dry float, and we're going to deepen. Deepen or establish, because there's not much there. We'll go back to our brush that I tried to throw, and we're going to load the pink chiffon, rose brush load. Ah. Okay, and now we're going to come in and we'll do our top petals, which are just little side deals. They make the rose, really. Like, anybody can do this. You've got to be able to slide that brush just on its chisel across. And that just makes the rose pop. We'll go into our, with our round brush, we'll go into the Hauser Light Green, and really dry, I'm going to go ahead and just highlight one part of the leaf. Just to make it pop, maybe just towards the inside. I think we're going to need a little bud or something. I think we need 
little something going on here. So maybe we'll have get some Hauser. Nope. Ha. Raspberry. And see how can I fit a bud in here? Maybe one over here. And maybe one coming out this way. And we're probably gonna have to do one more. Okay, so those little circles are the buds and we'll just then shade them and highlight them. So we'll go into pink chiffon. And we'll give that a little highlight. And then highlight under. Okay, my brush got dirty all the way across, so I have to rinse and reload. Um, if your paint starts developing skin, which is what mine is doing, and by the way, tiny floats have to be like almost perfectly dry. If your paint starts developing skin, get out some fresh paint because you won't be able to float tiny unless you have um, good paint to load into. You have to have precision loading. Okay, now we'll add some calyxes and stems. So we'll just swoop it up from the base, just a little wiggly stroke. You can have one coming up from behind. Sometimes it's hard just to find a good angle of holding. And see how that adds just that little bit of extra something? I think they may need to be shaded down just slightly. We can add a couple of other little leaves coming up the stem, so it's not just like hanging out there and go, oh, I missed stem. That's all I needed. Okay. And I think they do need to be toned back just a little bit, so I'll get my angle shader, go into raspberry, and just wash them down. And maybe we can go ahead with one side of our roses like we did on the Lazy Susan. Just tickling, almost dry rubbing with a damp brush. Don't want to base coat them out, but I do want them to sit down a little bit better. Okay, now I think we could benefit from some of those polka dots that we spread around on the other piece. And so now that I've said that, the reason that I'm hesitating is because I've got my, my dots in the middle with my little lacy design. So maybe what we'll do instead is bring just a little bit of vine. With a couple of little leaves. Oops, that's like not a leaf at all. So we'll draw this in to each other. and then sprinkle leaves. Yeah, like that. Okay, now we'll go in with Hauser Light Green. And anything you can't see, highlight. All right, I want to do some checks around here, but I want to make sure my line is going to be straight, so I'm going to sketch 
my line. I want to know where I need to stop, start and stop on this. Okay, and I want to make sure that I'm where I want to be. I don't want to get in there with my paint and then suddenly be like, oh crud, I screwed that up. Oops, like that. Going around this little area is going to be... Ugh. However, we have tools to make it easier. Okay, I think that got a little wonky. All right, so we're gonna do, I think, I wonder how this pink would look. Do we want some pink or do we want some green? I think we're gonna go pink. Okay, so pick up some paint. Nice flat. And we're going to start here, and we'll continue in here. Let the brush dictate the side, the sides. I'm going to go back and play with the checks, so don't worry about getting them finished just yet. And it's natural for me to go around this way, so I'm just going to continue that way. Going the opposite way was making my mind hurt. That, doesn't that just transform that little loop-de-loop -loop there? I think what's fun with the roses and lace is you can get really busy and it's okay, and it's fun. You can make some really, um, well, the word fun is really a good word, some fun treatments and not be excessive. <clears throat> okay, that worked out perfectly. Now we'll go through and we'll shade and highlight them. Okay, so dry, Oops, very dry, pink chiffon, same exact treatment as the others, don't know that we'll take the time to, um, okay, that's going to be too strong, so we're doing the corner thing. go all the way around. Okay, so I got this far, and I'm looking down at this thing, and it is getting so busy, like I don't like it like at all. Like it's cute, got too busy. I just said you can be so busy and have fun with it, but I have now given the front of this so much weight that the back end is not matching. Okay, so sometimes you can get too busy. So I'll just take my blue, and I'll back away, and do something different. Sometimes you might have two or three coats of paint on something, but who knows? Who cares? It's the discovery process. You know, you're in the process of learning what this piece needs. All right, I decided to go with just some green dots <clears throat> going around. Oops, I need to switch to my bigger... The green settles in and doesn't compete with my white, and that's why I chose that. So we'll just green dot and allow that to dry. Alright, I'm going to base this um, flat top with my blue color. And I'm going to do that little bit of faux finish on this just to give another area of piece a little bit of that um, same technique is on the, the base so I've just mixed some white with my blue 
was just all looking just a little bit blue. And because, hello. Okay, so I mixed, I mixed, um, I put a base coat of my dark blue on my piece, then I mixed a little bit of white, and now I'm just stippling a couple of layers on here to make it not look, the base faux finish not look quite so isolated. And then I'm tapping with the back of my brush that's clean to kind of blend it all together a little bit. And I think that that will give that a much more consistent look. All right, I'm going to base this area right here, and I want to show you that round brushes are the bomb when it comes to base coating finials. Anything round that has an area to be cupped, okay, so I'm just working a little bit of paint. This is a pro round, and so what I'm going to do is add just a little bit of water. Got to have flow. None of this works without flow, so I'll wipe off my ferrule. Pick up my brush, work it in, pick up my paint, work it in there. And then as soon as I get that to a consistency that will flow, notice how that just cups that edge right there. And this is the base of the topper. I can do two coats for coverage. If you cannot do this, in, watch, I'll show you something. This is so cool. Once I've made my stroke, look at how, let me find my camera, look at how the brush has held that shape. That is what a good round brush will do, is it will hold the shape that you make it hold. So if it's a flat, if you want it to be flat, this one will make a perfectly chiseled flat brush. Um, it will hold it while you're painting too, so you can make perfectly straight little checks. Okay, um, you can base coat with this without ridges. Now if you form it into its round shape and you start base coating, then you're going to get a whole bunch of round glommy glom stuff. But if you flatten it, it'll stay that way and it's perfect chisel. So this brush, and what's neat, okay, so we'll go back, we'll round it up. Now we're round, so now it'll, you know, do strokes. But what's neat is you can make it into just a tiny flat brush, okay, so just a little bit. So you don't necessarily have to have, this is a number four. Number four can be a whole bunch of things, and you can even flatten it into a really big flat brush. Okay, so look at that. So we went from that to that to that, all with one brush, plus we can make our strokes, plus we can base our finials. That is what a good brush will do for you. And that is, um, a hard thing to find in my um, in my understanding. I'm sure that there are some in every line of brushes, but you have to experiment um, and find them. I've found two that I really like, two from totally different lines. Um, this Pro Round and then the Easy Stroke both will do this consistently, like they're like perfect little round brushes. Okay, so we've got that on there, but we can't. Whoops, we can't just leave that that color because it's very. That's a very kind of drab pink. So dirty brush into pink chiffon, and while it's wet, we'll just go ahead and here, too much paint and globs of stuff. While it's wet, we'll just go ahead and give it a dry brush. Just to soften its color up. So that'll kind of be self-shading this way. We'll take the base of the candle cup, add some water. We're going to do exactly the same technique. Um, I won't sit with you through this because we've already did this exact technique, but I just want to show you that this is the piece that I'm doing and then this is the part. I think it's really important to um, visually guide you through this because there's a lot of confusion, like this level, this level. You can count them, but we all count differently. <laughs> Okay, now I'm reaching across from my um, Hauser, <coughs> pardon me, Hauser Medium Green to my um, Raspberry because I want to tone that green down just a little bit. don't want it to be quite so bright. And then I'm just going to paint this middle section. <coughs> 
Okay, I'm reaching across into raspberry and hauser medium. And I'm going to put a little teeny bit of water in there. I want my green not to be quite so bright. And I want my brush not to be quite so big. And that'll give me a nice toned green. Okay, I'll just paint that band. And I like the effect of that so much that I'm going back and I'm repairing um, the pink bands. So what I've done is I've mixed just a little bit of green in with my raspberry and see how Pepto-y that is and see how toned that is. I like that just a little better. The topper shouldn't be something that screams at you. It should be something that goes with the rest of the piece so it should sit down just a little bit. All right, we mixed a little bit of Hauser, dark, Hauser Medium Green in with our pink chiffon and I'm just going to make a band of lines going all the way around the pink areas. Watch your pressure. One way or the other, it can bite you. <clears throat> if you push too hard, then you'll end up with these weird uneven things. If you push too light, then you won't get a good contact. And go back and straighten anything up you don't like. Just like that. And I dare anybody to stare at this finial and find all the mistakes once it's done. Okay, now we're going to go in between. Oh, I've got to mix a little pile, so I'll just go ahead and get out a palette knife. You've got to have a pile of paint in order to be able to too much green and it'll make this a green color, a light green. <clears throat> Not enough and it'll be screaming. Okay, now I'm going to pile that up so I have something to dip into. And we'll go into the number four on the white. And we'll dip, oops, in between. Now I'll take a mix of the Hauser medium green, the raspberry, and the pink chiffon. And I'm going to turn this puppy upside down. And I'm going to make a line. Got a little bit of a flat bottom on it, so okay, and we'll just go around. And actually, I changed my mind. I think we're going to go in, mix those colors together. It's just a big old glommed up stuff. We're going to use our little um, number one round, and we're going to make some strokes. Now I'll have to let this dry between each stroke. And the idea is to go straight. And that's not so straight, so let's, let's see if we can't remedy that. There we go. It's better. So I'll get a couple done, I'll let it dry, I'll get a couple more done. Make sure this is working out pretty well. I'm going to glue my pieces together with just some um, quick dry tacky glue and I'm going to glue them together before they're done and the reason for that is is I don't I want to strap this into um, into my craft lathe to do some line work and I want to make sure that it's all together and dried before I do that so I'll just eyeball everything and get it all glued and let it dry and then I'll be ready to go Alright, I wanted to share, I don't like using, um, I don't like using sprays when I can, when I can avoid it. So what I wanted to share was this is a base coat and a varnish sponge. I left it in my bag just a little too long. I have a little bit of a lip there, but none of this is hard. If I had any hardened edges, you know, that I wanted to get rid of, I could just shave it with a pair of scissors. It doesn't matter what shape this is. Um, if it's irregular, it's irregular. That doesn't matter. So I'm just going to blot onto my varnish. 
Okay, so I've got just a little bit right there, and I really want this scantily applied because it's going to dry really quick. The thing that I wanted to avoid was getting inside of all these little groups. So what we're going to do is we're just going to pat on our varnish around that edge. And we'll just rotate and pat, and that will get a nice coat. We can even go onto our edges if we want to and then pat it again. When that dries, we'll be ready to do the inside and we'll just wipe that on. And what I like, go back one more step. This is something that's going to be used around food. So what we've got is DuraClear matte varnish. The DuraClear line is polyurethane and the polyurethane is the stuff that I use on my stepping stones outside. So if it can resist sunshine and um, you know, footsteps with rocks and pebbles, it's going to withstand anything grandkids or guests can do to it, or maybe husbands, right? Um, anyway, so then we'll just pat that all on. And allow it to dry, and then we'll put a coat of wax on it, and that will be our final step. One other thing to educate you on, I have to open a new bottle of varnish. Um, the varnish can settle, and the matte varnish has actually got a deglazer in it, so you actually need to shake your varnish when you get started. Otherwise, you're going to end up with all your deglazer at the bottom, and you'll end up with all the clear, shiny varnish at the top. So give it a good shake. You'll be able to see when it's kind of coming out or mixing. All right, I'm going to use some of my muddy pink with some glasses. And I'm going to dot this edge. I'm thinking I'm almost about done with this. I'll dot that edge, and I think we're going to dot the green in here. Okay, just to give that just a little bit more uniform look. All right, with the whole tamale strapped together, I'm going to push this on my Deluxe Craft Lay back. I loosened the little finger bolt. <clears throat> push that back. And then I'm going to put the fat end there, being careful about drying. I'm going to shove that there, centering it and tightening it. And making sure that I am indeed going straight. I'm going to take my Raphael. I haven't decided. I think I'm going to need my bridge as well. Need something to rest on. I love that the bridge goes right over the edges of this um, deluxe craft blade. And I think right on here we're going to need a band of something. Let's make it a band of green. A dirty pinky green. And a little bit of water. And a little bit more of my color. Okay, I'll get the right color. And it's just somewhere in that family. There's not as long as you're close, you're going to be fine. Okay, so then what I like about this, actually I think I'm going to add one right here. What I like about this is I can put my hand right here on this. Start making perfectly straight lines. That is what is fantastic about using the craft lathe with finials. So you can do your banding, your stroke work or whatever. Like I'm going to have to fix this right here because I got messy. And it's just super easy to do. Okay, so we'll take this, get it started, Rawr! and then I'm turning with my other hand, because that Raphael's got such a nice full belly, it's going to go all the way around here. And there you go, perfectly clean, awesome, you can't beat that. Right, because this is going to be a food-based or food-using thing, we're going to use um, the Clapham's Beeswax Salad Bowl Finish. And that's the important part is that it's a salad bowl finish. If you use like a floor wax on your eating surfaces or on things that come in contact with food, that is very um, unsafe. So you want to use a natural product. I'm just going to wipe this on 
buff it on all over my scallops too. This will repel water, this will protect your surface. Beeswax actually dries super hard. Like who would think that beeswax would? But I mean super hard. Like way more, um, way more better <laughs> than um, varnish. It is a really excellent fin uh, furniture finisher. So what you do is you put an even coat on and then you allow it to dry overnight or two days. And then you buff it off and it will buff to the most beautiful sheen. It'll be rich, it allows light to transport through. It is absolutely elegant. Okay, so I just get that on there, wipe off any excess. And then tomorrow we'll buff it down and we'll be ready to use it. All right, to glue, to get my this finial to be magnetic, I'm going to glue a little washer onto the base. I'll just collect a little bit of hot glue on there and presto, make sure you're kind of centered. Oops, my glue is not very hot. Hang on a second. There we go, that's better. Be careful not to burn your fingers. Okay, so now we can put the finial on our piece, center it, and you have a lovely finial for your Lazy Susan.